Hello and welcome. I'm Amir Sapkota, and in this module, we will talk about the chronic health effects of deliberate events. But before getting into that, let's recap what do we mean by deliberate events. The World Health Organization defines deliberate events as an act or threat involving intentional release of hazardous substances to cause harm. And in this regard, the scale matters. You know, there are small scale emergencies, such as contamination of a product for, uh, that's used for extortion, or a large scale disaster, for example, release of hazardous substance to kill or injure people destroy animals or crops, and this is done in a very large scale. To get this point, I will present two different case studies. The first one involves the World Trade Center attack, or 9-11. And the immediate impact of the terrorist attack was close to 3,000 deaths. But that does not capture the chronic health effect, particularly experienced by the first responders. Uh, because they are, even up to this date, they are experiencing various sort of health impact, which is not captured by those acute impact. But before getting into the chronic health impact, let's spend a moment and find out what were people, particularly those first responders, were exposed to during that very initial phase of the disaster. And in this particular case, a study was conducted by Leo and colleague, and they collected dust samples from the, uh, the disaster site. And they looked for various chemicals, including metals, pesticides, PCVs, and selected polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or what is commonly called PAHs. So right here, what it shows is the label of this different metals in the three different sites. And the metals include things such as lead, arsenic, silver, magnesium, and so forth. And on the right hand side, we see level of chemicals, including pesticides, PCVs, and PAHs. And I just highlight one particular PAH, benzoepyrin, and that shows the label of this nasty chemical that is known to cause cancer in human at a very high level in this site immediately after the disaster. And benzoepyrin is also the carcinogen that is present in tobacco smoke. So obviously these are not benign chemicals we're talking about. The point that I'm trying to make here is the workers that were involved in responding to the disaster, involved in cleaning that site, were all exposed to chemicals such as this. So fast forward 20 years. This 2022 study by Jarsa and colleagues investigated the risk of clonal hematopoiesis among first responders. Now, clonal hematopoiesis refers to acquisition of somatic mutation in blood cells, and it is associated with increased risk of blood cancer. And it is typically found among smokers, right? So they, Jarsa and colleagues looked at this clonal hematopoiesis among these first responders. And they had almost 481 World Trade Center dust exposed workers, and they compared those workers to other workers that were not exposed to the World Trade Center dust or non-WTC exposed workers in, in this case. And another thing they did that was really interesting was they also exposed mice with the World Trade Center dust or the particulate matter. Continuing on that, so this slide right here shows the number of somatic mutation in the World Trade Center exposed first responders on the red line and the control workers on the blue line. So what you see is that regardless of the age group, the level of that somatic mutation is higher in the workers that were exposed to the World Trade Center dust. And in the other part of their study, they expose rats with the WTC particles, the dust, and the, you know, the control rats did not receive that, right? So, and what they observed in this case is the genomic deletion was significantly higher in the rats that were exposed to the World Trade Center dust. 
In other words, they were able to reproduce the finding that they observed on the humans using rat models too. In a separate study, Bofetta and colleagues investigated the risk of cutaneous melanoma among this World Trade Center workers. And they studied a total of 44,000 non-Hispanic white workers that were involved in the World Trade Center rescue recovery effort. So they looked at it between 2002 and 2015. And what they observed was that the risk of cutaneous melanoma was higher in the latter period, 2010 to 2015 period. And the risk was considerably higher among workers who reported working in the site in the earlier part of the rescue and cleanup operation, right? So during September 11 and September 17, compared to workers who reported working late September 18 through June 30th of 2002, right? So meaning workers who were there at the very beginning, you know, very first week had a higher risk compared to workers who came later on. And that makes sense because the exposure, the propensity of exposure, obviously, was significantly higher right after the disaster. And the period effect also makes sense in the sense that they are seeing risk in the latter part, 2010 through 2015, because generally it takes time to develop this cancer, right? So they don't really see the cancer risk right away, even in the 2002 to 2009 period, but risk becomes more apparent during the 2010 to 2015 period. So we will move on to another case study. And in this case, I will give an example of Bhopal disaster. And from the onset, I want to acknowledge that this particular disaster was not a deliberate event, but I'm using it to illustrate the long-term health effects of large-scale man-made chemical disaster. What was the Bhopal tragedy? In December 3 of 1984, the Union Carbide facility in Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, India, underwent a major explosion. The plant manufactured bulk quantities of pesticide 7, and during that time, approximately 40 metric tons of highly toxic methyl isocyanate, or MIC, was released in the environment. So this was a major, major chemical disaster. And the other thing that made it really, you know, detrimental was, you know, this happened in the middle of the night. So when it happened, all the people in, in the surrounding areas were sleeping. So nobody had any warning. Nobody knew what was going on. So during the Bhopal disaster and immediately after that, close to 2,500 people died within one week. There were close to 200,000 people that were exposed. And by 1994, it was estimated that 6,000 people had died directly as a result of the Bhopal disaster. The most recent independent estimate suggests that over 20,000 people have died because of that disaster. Like I said earlier, the death that happened immediately after the disaster, that's an acute impact, right? But then there are also those hundreds of thousands of people that were exposed to the chemicals, MIC in this case. So what is happening to that population? What is happening to the children of mothers that were exposed to that chemical exposure during that time? So what studies have shown is that in this population, there is unusually high prevalence of cerebral palsy muscular dystrophy and Down syndrome, as well as other health impact, such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also blindness, learning difficulties, all among the children born to mothers who were exposed to this gaseous exposure. And recently, there's been a lot of discussion in the Indian media about how the local government is actually trying to bar the release of these findings from those studies. So this slide here shows prevalence of chronic respiratory morbidity in Bhopal disaster cohort. So these were the people that were actually exposed to the gaseous fume during the disaster. So this study tracked and surveyed uh, prevalence of respiratory morbidity among those population. 
and compare it to a control group that's highlighted on the green lines that were not exposed. And the exposed group are further divided into mildly exposed, moderately exposed, and the severely exposed, with the mildly exposed group highlighted in the blue, moderately exposed group in yellow, and the severely exposed group on red. So what we see is that in every survey that has been conducted almost like every five years since the disaster, the exposed group, irrespective of whatever your propensity of exposure was, mild, moderate, and severe, they all report higher prevalence of chronic respiratory morbidity compared to the control group. And finally, in the 2016 survey cycle, that's when it, things are appearing to come down to a situation where the exposed group's prevalence is close to similar to the control group's prevalence. So moving on, Misra and colleague in 2009 conducted a review study where they summarized all chronic health effects based on previous studies that were conducted up to that point. What they observed was this individual that were exposed to the noxious fume resulting from the Bhopal disaster still continued to suffer from many chronic health outcomes, including respiratory disorder, psychological and neurological disorders, reproductive effect, immunological effect, as well as cancer. And certainly there's also adolescent growth patterns, growth retardation in exposed adolescent males. So this slide summarizes sort of like the overall chronic health effect that we continue to see to this date long after the disaster on, on those populations that were exposed during that night back in 1984. So I hope these two case studies show you that the world moves on after such disaster, but the people that are exposed to this disaster continue to suffer from these chronic health effects years, decades after the disaster, right? So in this case, in Bhopal's case, it's, we're talking about almost like 40 years after the disaster. So a lot of people don't even know this was a big deal back then. Everybody in the world knew about Bhopal disaster, but not many people now know about it. But despite that, the people who were exposed in that particular instant in the December 3rd of 1984, they continue to suffer from this chronic health effect. Not only themselves, but their children continue to suffer from that as well. So such disasters have a potential to have a chronic health effect on multiple generation that lingers on long after the disaster. That concludes this presentation. Thank you.